Let's just look at the jugular venous waveform. Now, the tricky part about this, you know, to wrap your head around, is that the jugular venous waveform is actually talking about the right side of the heart, whereas the cardiac cycle is mostly talking about the left side of the heart. Now, you can have a cardiac cycle diagram of the right. You can have a uh, venous waveform of the left. But usually, I'm just talking about like standard practice. If they tell you it's a jugular venous waveform, they're talking about jugular veins, right? They're talking about the right side of the heart. Okay, so right side of the heart. So there's five kind of waves to know. And these waves are the things that we were already looking at when we looked at these original cardiac cycle diagrams. But we're just gonna talk about them in more detail. So again, we're primarily focused on the atrium now. We're not talking so much about the ventricles. We're just focused on the atrium. So we already talked about this A wave. So the A wave is gonna happen at the end of diastole, right, before systole. You wanna get as much blood as you can out of the atrium into the ventricles. So after passive filling, you're gonna have atrial control traction to eject that last bit of blood out. And that's going to be synonymous with the P wave on EKG. Remember, the P wave is responsible for really for atrial depolarization. So the P wave is atrial depolarization. The QRS is ventricular depolarization, which starts isovolumetric contraction of systole. And then the T wave is ventricular repolarization, which usually happens more or less at the very end of systole. And it's a little bit into the beginning of diastole. Okay. So Again, P wave, atrial systole, that's why you have atrial systole. Get that last bit of blood out of there, okay, atrial contraction. And so you can imagine if for whatever reason we didn't have P waves, we wouldn't really see the A waves on the jugular venous waveform because we wouldn't have very consistent atrial systole. And this is actually what happens in atrial fibrillation. We have absent uh, P waves, usually on EKG, we have an irregularly irregular rhythm. And P waves usually are not well discerned. And for that reason, we usually don't have A waves. There's not coordinated contractions of atrial systole and atrial fibrillation. So that's something to look for potentially if they give you a jugular venous waveform. So when you're thinking of the C wave, I like to think about uh, cusp for the C wave, so cusp. So A, for the A wave, we were thinking of the atrium, right? So the A wave, we were thinking of your atrial systole, atrium, however you wanna remember that. So A wave, you can think of atrial systole, right? But for the C wave, I think of cusp, like the tricuspid valve. So after you get your ventricular contraction, right? Right after you have your QRS and you get your ventricular contraction up here, what's gonna happen is the tricuspid valve will actually receive some of that pressure. As, as the right ventricle contracts, all that pressure is gonna get kind of shunted upward and the tricuspid valve will kind of protrude back into the atrium. And so from the perspective of the atrium, you'll see a little bump, right? That's gonna be your C wave from the contraction. So C, you can think of cusp like the tricuspid valve or you can think of C for contraction, right? Ventricular contraction. Okay, so after we've had our contraction, now, as this pressure rises and more blood is ejected, the right atrial pressure is gonna come down, right? As that right atrial pressure comes down in systole, this is gonna allow the atrium to get filled. So that's the idea. So that's gonna, we're gonna have relaxation while the ventricles are contracting. That relaxation is gonna allow us to have a lower pressure. Okay, so that's the X descent. Then we have our V wave. So I think of the V wave as the villing, okay? The villing or the filling, right? So this is the wave that's responsible for uh, atrial filling. And so you can see that up here. So now the pressures are coming back up because we have filling of the atrium. And that's because we're just about to start diastole at this point. So on the tail end of systole, we're gonna end up reaching some peak height here, which is gonna be our V wave, usually less than the A wave in terms of its pressure. And this is all because we're filling the left atrium. And as we're filling, there's gonna be a little bit of back pressure from the tricuspid valve that also contributes to this. And the reason I bring this up is because if for whatever reason you had, like let's say you had tricuspid regurgitation, for example. So as you're going through systole, if you have tricuspid regurgitation, a lot of the blood from the right ventricle is gonna be regurgitating through the tricuspid valve back into the right atrium. And so this V wave ends up like way up here. It's gonna be a lot higher than the A wave and the C wave because you have blood not only coming back from the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava, but you also have blood coming back from the right ventricle. And so you have even more filling because of this uh, incompetent tricuspid valve, okay? And so the V waves tend to be a lot higher if you have tricuspid regurgitation. Same thing is true on the left side of the heart. If you have mitral regurgitation, right, then you would expect your V wave of your left atrial waveform to be higher. Finally, we have our Y descent, 
which is associated with moving that blood from the right atrium into the right ventricle. And so we're going to get a decrease in pressure. And eventually after we're filling, right, we're going to get the last amount of blood out and then we'll start all over again by ejecting that last amount of blood from the atrium into the ventricle through atrial systole, which starts with the P wave. Now I put some of these additional topics on here, but again, a lot of this you can think about and it makes intuitive sense. So in cardiac tamponade, the, there's a blunting of the wide descent, and that's because it's, it's very difficult to relax the atria in cardiac tamponade. So that's why the wide descent will be very blunted. So the V wave will be here, and then it'll kind of look like that. In constrictive pericarditis, though, you have more pressure kind of pushing down on those lower pressure chambers, and so it actually causes the blood to leave the uh, left atrium or right atrium much faster. And so your wide descent looks more like this in constrictive pericarditis. Okay, and then if for whatever reason your atria is contracting, when you undergo atrial systole, right, that first phase, the A wave phase, if you undergo atrial systole and the tricuspid valve is closed, you're pushing all that blood against a closed valve. So that's gonna generate these recoil pressures that are very high, and that's gonna cause these cannon A waves. So it's gonna be A waves that are very, very high, okay? So cannon A waves are associated with an atria that's contracting against a closed tricuspid valve. Why would the tricuspid valve be closed? Well, maybe the atria is contracting too early. It could be premature atrial contractions, right? That's very classic. Or in a third degree AV block, the atria and the ventricles are not associated at all. They're contracting at random times. And so the tricuspid valve might be closed when the atria is contracting in a third degree AV block, for example.